After defeating Archelaus at Chaeronea, Sulla proceeded towards Thessaly to meet up with the consul Lucius Valerius Flaccus, who was arriving from Italy. However, Sulla was unaware that Flaccus had been dispatched to attack him rather than join forces. During his journey, Sulla received news of Pontic reinforcements landing at Chalcis. Led by Dorolaus, these reinforcements included a substantial fleet and 80,000 highly skilled and disciplined soldiers. They were eager to reclaim Greece and avenge their losses suffered at Chaeronea. Behind Sulla's back, Dorolaus and Archelaus collaborated, amassing a combined army of about 90,000 soldiers, and they secured control over Boeotia. The generals decided to establish their camp at Orcomenus, situated to the east of Chaeronea. Orcomenus provided an ideal battleground for their well-equipped army, featuring a vast, open plain along the river Malos. This terrain favored their superior cavalry of 10,000 horsemen. However, they were cautious about avoiding the swampy areas on the edges of the plain. Yet, Archelaus also took precautions by establishing a well-fortified camp behind his forces in case the situation took an unfavorable turn. The subsequent battle was marked by greater confusion compared to the more structured engagement at Chaeronea. This complexity is evident in the descriptions provided by ancient sources. While these accounts aren't exactly contradictory, they do highlight different aspects of the battle, making it challenging to fully comprehend. Nonetheless, all narratives concur on a central point, Sulla's strategic move to counter Archelaus's cavalry advantage by constructing extensive ditches, each measuring 10 feet in width. These ditches were aimed at rendering certain portions of the plain unsuitable for horsemen, effectively neutralizing the impact of Archelaus's cavalry. Archelaus was determined not to relinquish his prized advantage over the enemy's forces without a fight. Consequently, his cavalry swiftly surged forth from the Pontic camp, catching the Romans off guard and preventing them from forming a proper defensive formation. Witnessing the rapid advance of the Pontic cavalry numbering in the thousands, Sulla's troops succumbed to panic and started retreating towards the security of their camp. Unfortunately, for many, reaching the camp before being overtaken by the enemy cavalry seemed nearly impossible. This critical moment nearly resulted in the battle being lost before it even had a chance to commence in earnest. Sulla emerged as the savior of the situation through his individual efforts. He positioned himself at the earthworks and shouted vehemently at his faltering soldiers. His words resonated with determination as he exclaimed, Orcaminos! Remember the name. I am prepared to fight and die here. When questioned about where you deserted your general, let your response be, at Orcaminos. This declaration left the troops feeling embarrassed and motivated to regain their composure. Sulla's officers, feeling a sense of remorse, rallied around him, and with their support, the Roman legionaries found the resolve to stand their ground. Their determination held firm long enough for two cohorts that hadn't yet been engaged to rush to their aid. The Pontic forces, led by Archelaus's son Diogenes, fought with great intensity. It's likely that it was during this phase that Diogenes perished in combat. Nonetheless, the Pontic cavalry struggled in a static battle against the infantry, particularly as additional Roman reinforcements continuously joined the fray. Eventually, the Pontic cavalry was compelled to retreat. The Romans pursued them, advancing towards the Pontic archers who were attempting to assist the cavalry. The Pontic archers found themselves under immense pressure from the close quarter combat initiated by the Romans. This pressure was so intense that the archers couldn't even draw their bows. Resorting to using handfuls of arrows as makeshift swords, they valiantly fended off the Roman soldiers. Secure within the safety of his camp, Archelaus observed Sulla's rapid construction of new earthworks. In response, Archelaus led his troops out once again, this time adopting a more organized and structured battle formation. It's highly probable that the details of this formation are derived from Sulla's own memoirs, transmitted through Frontinus, who documented it in his stratagems. The front line of Archelaus's forces was comprised of scythe chariots, which were finally able to gain a clear run-up against the Roman formations. Following the chariots, the Macedonian-style phalanx was poised to capitalize on the confusion that the chariots would sow among the Roman ranks. 
positioned behind the phalanx were the escaped Italian slaves who had demonstrated their steadfast resistance at Carinia. These former slaves were now armed and equipped akin to Roman auxiliaries. The cavalry, stationed on both flanks, were concentrated for impact. However, the effectiveness of the Pontic cavalry was hindered by the earthworks Sulla had managed to construct. These earthworks extended to the outermost points of the flanks and culminated in earthen fortifications, thus impeding the maneuverability and effectiveness of Archelaus's cavalry. Sulla's own army was arranged into three distinct lines, with deliberate gaps between the individual soldiers. These gaps allowed for the movement of light infantry or even cavalry through the lines if necessary. Sulla had also organized his post-signati differently from his antesignati. The antesignati formed a more tightly packed front, while the post-signati had more space behind them. The purpose behind this unique formation became evident when the scythe chariots were hurtling towards the Roman formations. As the scythe chariots approached the Roman lines, the frontline legionaries executed a swift sidestep and backward movement. This maneuver revealed a dense arrangement of stakes driven into the ground at calculated angles to maximize impalement. As the first wave of chariots raised inexorably towards their doom, Roman javelin men swiftly moved through the ranks to take opportunistic shots at any chariots that managed to swerve and avoid the stakes, attempting to veer away to safety. However, this perceived safety was short-lived, as the Macedonian-style phalanx was advancing rapidly to exploit the turmoil caused by the side chariots. The collision between the chariots and the phalanx resulted in damage to both sides, underscoring the mutual harm incurred. Nevertheless, this collision highlighted that side chariots could indeed generate chaos when confronting ill-prepared infantry formations. Sulla, actively encouraging his troops forward, left Archelaus with little alternative but to commit his cavalry to the battle. Archelaus hoped that while his phalanx regrouped, his cavalry could engage the Romans, who were now bracing themselves to confront the horsemen. In this critical situation, Sulla's extensive military expertise came into play. He had anticipated this maneuver and devised a countermeasure by sending his own cavalry charging through the openings in the Roman ranks that had been cleared of javelin men. Though vastly outnumbered, Sulla's cavalry had a crucial role, even a brief delay would suffice. Their objective was to momentarily impede the onslaught of the numerous Pontic horsemen. This momentary interruption was pivotal. Despite the odds, Sulla's infantry continued their steady advance, and as the Pontic cavalry became entangled in combat with Sulla's horsemen, the Roman infantry struck. They confronted the Pontic cavalry while it was engaged in the melee with Sulla's horsemen. Slicing their way through the Pontic cavalry, the Roman legionaries moved in to engage the phalanx. Contrary to Archelaus's expectations, the phalanx had not managed to reposition and reorganize as he had hoped. However, Archelaus had learned from earlier mistakes. He ensured that the Phalangites had a clear and safe pathway of retreat leading back to their camp. As a result, the casualties suffered among his infantry were relatively limited, totaling around 5,000 men. Throughout the various stages of the battle thus far, the cavalry on both sides had endured heavy losses. The Pontic cavalry had been particularly hard hit, with their numbers plummeting by approximately 10,000 horsemen. With the events of the day concluded, Sulla recognized that despite the significant damage inflicted on Archelaus's army, the enemy still maintained a numerical advantage over his own forces. Sulla understood that if he allowed Archelaus to escape, the Pontic general might adopt a strategy of attrition similar to that of Fabius Maximus. Such an outcome would render Sulla's victory meaningless. To prevent this, Sulla kept a substantial portion of his troops prepared and vigilant throughout the night. As dawn broke, Sulla wasted no time. He initiated the construction of additional earthworks positioned less than 600 feet from the Pontic camp. On the other side, Archelaus rallied his troops, highlighting that they still held a numerical superiority over an enemy that had audaciously subjected them to siege. The Pontic soldiers responded with the unwavering determination that was characteristic of their army in battle. They surged over their camp's defenses, coinciding with the Romans, spurred on by Sulla, launching a sortie of their own. This set the stage for yet another intense and chaotic confrontation. 
the clash pitted Sulla's legionaries, known for their discipline and adaptability, against the larger Pontic force driven by sheer numbers and an unyielding spirit. Eventually, the Romans managed to breach a section of the Pontic fortifications. However, they were confronted by yet another inner wall, composed of resolute Pontic soldiers standing steadfastly shoulder to shoulder. The Roman forces hesitated, waiting for an opportunity to exploit the situation. At this critical juncture, a young officer named Basilus threw himself at a Pontic soldier opposite him and killed him. This daring act served as a catalyst, prompting the Romans to surge into the gap and initiate a devastating massacre. With their retreat impeded by the marshland, the remnants of Archelaus's army that abandoned the camp had nowhere to escape. The waters gradually turned crimson with blood. Even centuries later, Plutarch reported that artifacts like bows, breastplates, and barbarian swords were still frequently unearthed from the muddy grounds. In the aftermath of the battle, Sulla's troops were not inclined to take prisoners. The brutality of the engagement left no room for boasting about light Roman casualties. Moreover, due to their status as a renegade army, the Sullan forces had little use for captives. This marked another instance where a Pontic army suffered severe losses at the hands of Roman swords. Archelaus managed to survive the defeat, slipping away from the battlefield and making his way back to Euboea in a small boat. Undoubtedly, he contemplated how Mithridates would react upon receiving news of this latest catastrophic failure. When this news reached Mithridates he realized that the war was effectively over and ordered Archelaus to seek peace terms. Sulla and Archelaus soon agreed terms and later developed a close friendship. At first Mithridates turned down some of the terms, but his position in Asia Minor began to deteriorate. The army of Flaccus, now under the control of Fimbria, won a victory over Mithridates' son at Melitopolis, while a fleet under Lucius Licinius Lucullus defeated the Pontic fleet at Tenedos. Mithridates then agreed to a personal meeting with Sulla, at which he accepted all of the original terms.